two water bottles and tells you how much I'm going to say. Uh, <laughs> thank you for coming out. Thank you uh, for incredible music. Once upon a time, I went to BYU as a lowly freshman, hoping to study music, and found out I had no talent. <laughs> and so I became a philosopher. <laughs> uh, here we are. That was beautiful. Uh, before I say a word uh, about our topic, um, I want to make clear that I'm nervous uh, about it. Not nervous about the topic itself. Uh, I'm confident about everything I'm going to say. Um, but I'm worried about speaking about this simply because I'm a man, right? Uh, I worry about, one, how that looks, right? Uh, I'm going to come and say what uh, is going on with women in the Book of Mormon. Uh, but especially I'm concerned because uh, these thoughts are not my own thoughts alone. Uh, so I want to acknowledge right at the outset, anything I say tonight is a part of a project that I have worked uh, on together with uh, one of my dearest friends, Kimberly Berkey, who is a PhD student in theology at, the, at Loyola University in Chicago. She is in Chicago tonight rather than here. Uh, but um, I wanted to make clear that this is not my, my work alone that I'm sharing. Uh, all right, uh, we've got some time to talk about uh, a problem tonight, uh, a problem in the Book of Mormon. I've titled my talk uh, to be a bit provocative. Nephi had sisters? <laughs> That's the title here. Uh, what motivates this is this passage right here. Second Nephi 5, uh, if you're reading along through the Book of Mormon, you're 27 chapters in. You've got a lot of story about Nephi to this point. And suddenly here in Second Nephi 5, this is the moment where uh, Nephi has to leave his brothers because they're threatening his life after his father's death. Uh, and he tells us this, And it came to pass that the Lord did warn me that I, Nephi, should depart from his brothers, Laman and Lemuel, and flee into the wilderness and all those who would go with me. Wherefore it came to pass that I, Nephi, did take my family, and also Zoram uh, and his family, and Sam, my elder brother, and his family, and Jacob and Joseph, my younger brethren, and also my sisters, and all those who would go with me, and all those who would go with me were those who believed in the warnings and revelations of God. They did hearken unto my voice. This is the first time in the Book of Mormon that Nephi mentions the fact that he has sisters. 27 chapters in. Uh, there's something very puzzling about this. Now, scholars have tried to make sense of this verse in a variety of ways. Some have thought, uh, if you're familiar with the stories in 1 Nephi, some have argued that, well, Nephi's sisters are probably the wives of the sons of Ishmael. They've married into that family beforehand. That's, of course, possible. It may be that Nephi is using the word symbolically. These are his spiritual sisters, just the women in the company, and he's calling them sisters. There are various ways one might make sense of it. I'm not interested in that tonight. Uh, I'm not interested in solving uh, what Nephi is referring to here. Well, what interests me is the fact that there's something screwy Frankly, something screwy about the fact that Nephi goes this long before mentioning sisters. Uh, something maybe even symptomatic. Uh, why on earth does Nephi not tell us about them up front? Uh, why so belatedly? Uh, and it's frankly concerning. And in the 21st century, maybe more concerning than ever. Uh, the fact of the matter is, uh, so we're going to start on a harsh note, right? The fact of the matter is that the Book of Mormon has a gender problem. There is something that just seems off here that we can see. So problems concerning women in the Book of Mormon. So first of all, there's just this general problem that there are so few women with names. Only six in the whole book, and three of those are biblical women, uh, Eve and Sarah uh, and Mary. Uh, only three uniquely Book of Mormon women have names in the whole 530-page book. And that should give us pause. Add to that that though there are other uh, individual female characters beyond those six, uh, those, uh, those who do show up are very few. And most of the women mentioned in the Book of Mormon are absorbed into large, vague crowds of women and children. Uh, they don't have stories of their own, most of them. There are some, and we'll say a little bit about them. But on the whole, women are startlingly absent from this book. Some people will say, oh, it's because it's an ancient book. Well, read the Bible. There are a lot more women per page in the Bible, and a lot more individual women per page in the Bible. There's something going on here that needs thinking. Add to that this, uh, maybe the most concerning detail of all. What stories you have of women in the Book of Mormon are, on the whole, stories of violence, abuse, rape, torture, 
kidnapping. Uh, there is a, an astonishing frequency of these kinds of events as soon as women come into the story of the Book of Mormon. Now again, not all the stories, but the majority by far. Uh, so what on earth do we make of this? This is the problem I want to try to speak to tonight, uh, say something about, uh, and uh, that I want to draw on this work that Kim Berkey and I have been doing together to try to forge an approach to move forward with this. So. Um, what I want to lay out is what I'll call a, a possible approach. One way of maybe making sense of all of this that, uh, at least we're convinced, uh, may get us somewhere. What we want to do here is focus in on just a couple of chapters for a few minutes from the book of Jacob. Jacob chapters 1 through 3. Uh, and, uh, and take a look at what we have happening here. Now if you know the book well, uh, in Jacob 1 through 3, uh, we get... Uh, we get a situation after Nephi's death. Nephi has been the sort of first king, and he's done all kinds of good, but then suddenly, uh, after Nephi's death, we have a situation where um, uh, Nephite men are seeking many wives and concubines. You can see how this is worded here. It came to pass that the people of Nephi under the reign of the second king began to grow hard in their hearts and indulge themselves somewhat in wicked practices, such as like unto David of old, desiring many wives and concubines, and also Solomon his son. Yea, and they also began to search much gold and silver and began to be lifted up somewhat in pride. Here Jacob identifies two problems that crop up the second Nephi is dead. Uh, first, Nephite men are seeking out many wives and concubines. Second, they're seeking out much gold and silver. Now, if we put the Book of Mormon in an ancient context, almost certainly these two things are connected. Uh, right? Women are, uh, as despicable as this is uh, to say, in the ancient world, women are property. They are owned uh, and the idea of having many wives and concubines in most ancient cultures where that was practiced uh, is a form of, uh, of, of demonstration of one's power and wealth. Uh, so almost certainly, the, as the Book of Mormon is reporting this event, these are intertwined. What's striking is that Jacob disentangles them. He pulls them apart uh, and does not treat them as the same. He spends a few verses talking about what's going on with wealth and seeking out wealth among the Nephites. Uh, you can see the passage here, right? This is the word which I declare unto you. Many of you have begun to search for gold and for silver. The hand of providence hath smiled upon you most pleasingly. You have obtained many riches, and so on. But because of this, uh, some of you are lifted up in the pride of your hearts, wear stiff necks and high heads, and all of this kind of thing. But after a few verses, and really only just a few verses, he says this, and now, uh, oh good, I have a zapper. Uh, and now I make an end of speaking unto you concerning this pride, were it not that I must speak unto you concerning a grosser crime, my heart would rejoice exceedingly because of you. And Jacob peels apart as a separate, grosser crime what's happening with women uh, in this Nephite context. Uh, that is a striking thing in an ancient context, that he would peel these apart and want to address this as a separate issue. What does he have to say as he goes on? Well, uh, first of all, he addresses the problem directly. The word of God, he says, burdens me because of your grosser crimes. For behold, thus saith the Lord, this people begin to wax in iniquity. They understand not the scriptures. They seek to excuse themselves in committing whoredoms because of the things which uh, were written concerning David and Solomon his son. Behold, David and Solomon truly had many wives and concubines, which thing was abominable before me, saith the Lord. Uh, to that point, this is relatively straightforward. He says, okay, uh, Nephite men are seeking out many wives and concubines. They're doing this by reference to David and Solomon uh, in their own version of the Old Testament and their version of the scriptures and saying this is what people do once they've grown wealthy, right? Uh, and so this is, practice has been extended uh, to the Nephites by these men. Uh, straightforward condemnation of it. Which thing was abominable before me? The really interesting detail comes in the last little bit here. Wherefore thus saith the Lord, just continuing on there, uh, I have led this people forth out of the land of Jerusalem by the power of mine arm, that I might raise up unto me a righteous branch from the fruit of the loins of Joseph. That's a really interesting passage, uh, and especially this little business about the loins of Joseph. Of course, if you're familiar with the Book of Mormon, the Nephites and Lamanites are uh, descendants uh, of Joseph of Egypt, right? One of the 12 sons of, uh, of Jacob or Israel in the Bible. Uh, but there's, a, there's quite a bit more going on here than that might uh, at first just suggest. It's not just that they happen to be from the tribe of Joseph. There's something more going on. Uh, David and Solomon are kings back in the city of Jerusalem. Uh, they are from the tribe of Judah. 
and they rule over people that are simply called the nation, the kingdom of Judah. Judah is one of the other sons of Jacob, or of Israel, uh, and uh, this is the nation that Nephi and his family have left behind. They've walked away uh, from the kingdom of Judah uh, and from the people of Judah, and they are themselves Josephites. Uh, and here, what we have going on, it seems, wherefore thus saith the Lord, uh, I have led this people forth out of the land of Jerusalem. Uh, the Nephite men are apparently making an appeal to the practices of the kings of Judah and saying, this is why we're doing this. The response from Jacob here is to quote God uh, and say, the whole reason you're out here is to get you specifically away from what's going on in Judah. Don't appeal to that. You're something else. In fact, you come from the loins of Joseph. Uh, it's a very nuanced distinction, and at first might not seem like it's important, but if you read your book of Genesis, I assume this is the background we're supposed to understand here. Uh, so a little bit of a tangent here on Judah and Joseph. If you read the last third or so of the book of Genesis, you get a long story about these two brothers, Judah and Joseph. They're both rivals, um, right? two of Jacob's sons, uh, but both of them seeking to inherit uh, everything that their father has. And there's this kind of open question, which one of them will it be? Judah, who seems to be the rightful heir, or Joseph, the one that Jacob actually likes? Uh, if you know your story, coat of many, many colors. Uh, but there's this ongoing question there. As the story of Judah and Joseph begins, what you get is two side-by-side -side stories about these two figures. Stories that introduce you to the two of them, to Judah and then to Joseph. The story of Judah comes in Genesis 38. If you're not familiar with the story of Judah and Tamar, you should reread your Bible. Uh, it's a fascinating, complex, and very disturbing story. So Genesis 38, this is the story of Judah and Tamar. Here we get introduced to who Judah is as a person. Uh, the story is complex, I've only excerpted a couple of little snippets here. But essentially Judah has a, has a daughter-in-law that he has responsibility toward, and he is not fulfilling that. Uh, he is supposed to marry her to his youngest son, and he is refusing um, out of self-interest. Uh, she takes matters into her own hands and goes and dresses as a prostitute and stands by the side of the road. This is where we pick up here. When Judah saw her, he thought her to be an harlot because she had covered her face. And he turned unto her by the way and said, Go to, I pray thee, let me come in unto thee. For he knew not that she was his daughter-in-law. And this happens. He goes in uh, and she ends up pregnant by him. Uh, Eventually, the word comes back to him that his daughter-in-law is pregnant. She is not married uh, and belongs to his family. So this is the scene as it picks up down below. It came to pass about three months after that it was told Judah, saying, Tomorrow thy daughter-in-law hath played the harlot. And also, behold, she is with child by whoredom. And Judah said, Bring her forth and let her be burnt. When she was brought forth, though, she sent to her father-in-law, saying, By the man whose these are, she's got these tokens that he had left with her, am I with child? Judah acknowledged them and said, she hath been more righteous than I. Now again, it's a really complex story. It's worth your time and attention. The gist of the story, for our purposes, is simply this. Judah is presented here as an oppressor of women, right? Is acting wrongfully toward this woman, uh, and is, I mean, both in general terms, in social terms, uh, but also in strictly sexual terms, uh, and is violent toward her and so on. He does acknowledge his wrong in the end, thank the heaven, but only just in time. Uh, and it's not clear how much he really uh, feels repentant about it, so to speak. This whole story is followed immediately by a much better known story, the story of Joseph in the house of Potiphar. We get side by side these two stories of Judah and Joseph. The story of Joseph, very famously, he ends up in uh, the house of Potiphar, sold as a slave in Egypt by his brothers. Uh, and Potiphar's wife gets interested in him, right? This is the first snippet above. Came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph. She said, lie with me. But he refused and said unto his master's wife, behold, my master wotteth not what is with me in the house, and he hath committed all that he hath into my hand. Uh, there is none greater in this house than I, neither hath he kept back anything from me but thee, because thou art his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Later, after uh, this kind of situation is going on for some time, it came to pass about this time that Joseph went into the house to do his business, and there was none of the men of the house there within, and she caught him by his garment, saying, Lie with me. And he left his garment in her hand and fled and got him out. This doesn't go well for Joseph, right? He ends up in prison as a result of the situation. Uh, 
However, notice that back to back here, we have a story then, not only of Judah as sexual oppressor, but Joseph as sexual innocent. Uh, Joseph is the one who flees from this opportunity uh, and, uh, and runs out, literally runs out. Uh, I think that this is the backdrop that Jacob is assuming here. Judah, he is picturing as uh, oppressor of women. What David and Solomon as the kings of Judah have done is abominable before God. Women have been sexual objects and possessions, uh, and it has been a disastrous situation. And God has led Lehi's family out of Jerusalem to raise up a righteous branch specifically from the fruit of the loins of Joseph. I think this is the echo that people uh, he's speaking to are supposed to hear. Don't appeal to Judah. The reason you're out here, Josephites, is because you're supposed to embody the Joseph uh, you've read about in your Bible. You are supposed to create a new sexual culture, a new gender culture, uh, that looks fundamentally different from what had been there before. Uh, notice that as he goes on, this is still Jacob uh, speaking, uh, for behold, well, quoting the Lord, for behold, I, the Lord, have seen the sorrow and heard the mourning of the daughters of my people in the land of Jerusalem. It's very explicit there. When God looks on Jerusalem, he sees oppression for women, mourning by women. Uh, yea, and in all the lands of my people. It's not just in Jerusalem. Apparently, everywhere Israel has been, there are problems for women, stated explicitly in the text. Uh, and notice, specifically, because of the wickedness and abominations of their husbands, women are mourning because of how men relate to them. Uh, goes on, and I will not suffer, saith the Lord of hosts, that the cr cries of the fair daughters of this people, which I have led out of the land of Jerusalem, shall come up against, uh, unto me against the men of my people, saith the Lord of hosts. This will change. It's the claim. Now notice the radical move Jacob's making here. Uh, if you read these uh, couple of passages, this last one and this one together, uh, Jacob seems to be claiming something like this. The whole reason Lehi's family has left Jerusalem is for reasons of gender. It has something to do with the status of women. That's really quite a claim, right? But that seems to be Jacob's meaning. Uh, the reason we are out here at all, the reason we are not back in the land of Jerusalem, is because of what's going on there with respect to gender. Uh, now, it might seem a bit churlish of Jacob if the second the Nephites come up with this idea of having many wives and concubines, I should say these Nephite men come up with the idea of having many wives and concubines, uh, it would be a bit churlish of Jacob to show up and go, don't you know this is what God is really doing and so on, right? But notice what he says as he goes on just a little bit further, a couple verses later. After quoting all of these things that he attributes to the Lord, he says, Now behold, my brethren, ye know that these commandments were given to our father Lehi, wherefore ye have known them before. That's a very striking detail. Apparently, they have heard this because Lehi has been saying this from the very beginning. Here Jacob goes even further. It's not just Jacob's idea or Jacob's quotation of the Lord, something he has just learned from the Lord uh, as a new idea, that Nephites uh, and Lamanites have come to the new world to change culture surrounding uh, the sexes. It's not, uh, not simply that. That has been the program from the beginning. That's his claim, that Lehi was himself already laying this out. Jacob asks us to imagine as readers that from the moment Lehi leaves Jerusalem, he is explaining to Nephi, Laman, Lemuel, Sam, everyone there, Nephi's sisters that he belatedly mentions, he's explaining to all of them that the whole point of this project of moving to the other side of the world is about changing something surrounding women. So that's quite a passage, right? Uh, if we're reading it rightly, I think we are. Uh, quite a passage. It suggests that the whole of the Book of Mormon, that the whole book is in some deep way about gender, and that we should really deeply be asking questions about women in this book and what's going on. Uh, add this detail, if Lehi has already been teaching this from the beginning, then notice what Jacob can do as soon as he reminds them of that. He can say, Nephite men, ye have done greater iniquities than the Lamanites our brethren. He can draw out a comparison because the Lamanites, as much as the Nephites, have heard this. Lehi dies before the Nephites and Lamanites divide into rival nations. Nephites and Lamanites alike know the project. Uh, and the Nephites are on, uh, uh, are on a problematic uh, trajectory. Uh, the Lamanites, apparently, less so. All right, so far, so good. 
take one step further now. In light of this comparison he draws here with the Lamanites, this is what he does as he goes on. Except ye repent, he says to Nephite men, the land is cursed for your sakes, and the Lamanites, which are not filthy like unto you, shall scourge you even unto destruction. So notice here a very specific uh, prediction uh, that Jacob makes to the Nephite men. If you don't fix this, if you don't change what's happening with women in your culture, you will be destroyed. By the Lamanites, specifically. And then he goes on to say this about the Lamanites. Behold, the Lamanites, your brethren, whom ye hate, are more righteous than you, for they have not forgotten the commandments of the Lord, which was given unto our father. They remember what Lehi said. They should have, save it were one wife, concubines, they should have none, and there should not be whoredoms committed among them. This commandment they observe to keep. Wherefore, and this is so precisely worded, wherefore, because of this observance, in keeping this commandment, the Lord God will not destroy them, but will be merciful unto them, and one day they shall become a blessed people. Two predictions, back to back here. First, uh, Jacob says, if Nephite men do not fix this, the Nephite nation will end. Second, the Lamanite nation, because of what is going on there, specifically with respect to women, will be preserved and become a blessed people. It's a really striking passage. He goes on to add this about how things look among the Lamanites, at least at the time. Behold, their husbands love their wives, their wives love their husbands, and their husbands and their wives love their children, and their unbelief and their hatred toward you is because of the iniquity of their fathers. Something is going right between the sexes, apparently, among the Lamanites. This is Jacob's claim. Uh, so this is a really striking thing as well. Not only do we have uh, in Jacob's sermon uh, a claim that from the very beginning, the whole Book of Mormon project is about the status of women in this society. Add to that this crucial detail, that uh, destruction for the Nephites and preservation for the Lamanites is connected to that whole question. Now we might ask a question here. Uh, how, uh, how applicable are Jacob's words here to the whole of the Book of Mormon? And he's speaking in a very specific context, right? He's speaking to Nephite men right after Nephi dies. Is this just a problem then? Uh, and he's trying to address that, or is this a bigger problem? Now notice this. The Nephites are in fact destroyed at the end of the Book of Mormon, and the Lamanites are in fact preserved at the end of the Book of Mormon. So the question we should ask is, is Jacob giving us a lens to see the whole book, or is he speaking only to his own time? Is he trying to address a problem right then and there, or is he speaking to something uh, that stretches across the whole thousand year history of Lehi's children? That's the question we want to ask. Uh, you could, of course, just say, well, this is a problem in Jacob's time. And maybe they solved it, maybe they didn't, maybe this is why they eventually have to leave the land of Nephi and go to the land of Zarahemla. Uh, perhaps, perhaps this has limited application. But what if, what if we take what Jacob says here as a lens to read the whole book? Does that make sense of it? So here's what we want to do for a couple of minutes. We want to think uh, through the stories we get in the Book of Mormon of women. What do they look like? I mean, we've already mentioned that there's a, a startling propensity toward violence and abuse as you go through the book, that women are constantly the objects uh, of abuse and hence of suffering. Uh, but are there patterns? What can we see here? So we want to do this in two quick stages. First, we want to consider the stories where we have women uh, among Nephite men. How do women fare when they're dealing with Nephite men? Then we want to consider stories where we're dealing with women who are among Lamanite men. How do women fare among Lamanite men? If you could put these side by side, uh, is what Jacob describes here happening in his time, is it unique to his time or is it stretched across the whole of the Book of Mormon? So let's start with women among Nephite men. Stories that we get. The very first stories we get once we get uh, out of these small plates where Jacob is writing, the very first story we get is Noah and his priests reducing women to harlotry, uh, having many wives and concubines, repeating exactly what's going on in Jacob's time. Uh, we get Noah just a, a little bit later commanding his men that are being attacked by an incoming Lamanite army. We get Noah commanding his men to leave their wives behind to face an incoming Lamanite army alone. Some of those uh, Nephite men don't. They stay with their wives, but when they do, uh, they send their daughters out to plead for their lives. Uh, then after uh, Noah has been killed by some of his followers and his priests run off into the wilderness, his priests kidnap a group of 24 Lamanite girls, force them into marriage, 
uh, and then later, when they are confronted by an army, force their wives to go out and plead for their lives. Uh, Book of Mosiah is not faring well here, yeah? Every reference we have to women in the Book of Mosiah looks disastrous for women specifically dealing with Nephite men. Continues into the Book of Alma. Uh, we get the story in Ammonihah of women burning alive uh, for their belief. Uh, they cast the men who believe out of town and throw rocks at them, but they throw the women into this pit and burn them alive. Uh, later, we get Isabel reduced to harlotry, visited by Corianton, the high priest's son. Uh, Morianton's maidservant, maybe a somewhat obscure story, uh, but Morianton's maidservant in the war chapters, uh, she is beaten uh, severely by her master, uh, and then she goes to Captain Moroni for help. Uh, we get the story of Amalekiah going among the Lamanites, he's a Nephite man, going among the Lamanites and usurping the throne of the queen when uh, her husband is dead through deception uh, and seduction. Uh, we get um, Samuel the Lamanite shows up among the Nephites and when he predicts disaster coming to the Nephites in the future, he says that pregnant and nursing mothers uh, will face abandonment and violence when disaster comes. The Nephite women are facing serious difficulties. And then the worst of it all, Moroni chapter nine at the end of the book, uh, Mormon writing to his son Moroni tells us that the Nephite soldiers are capturing Lamanite girls and then torturing them, raping them, murdering them, and cannibalizing them. Notice this, from start to finish, among the Nephites, every story about women is a story of abuse and violence, kidnapping, murder, rape. There are only one or two possible exceptions. Moroni saying we're fighting for our wives or something like that, right? Just a couple of very brief exceptions. But what we have running through the whole book among the Nephite, in Nephite culture, is a situation that is devastatingly bad for women. By contrast, take a look at what we have among Lamanites. Uh, here we have, uh, the very first story is now in the book of Mosiah again. We have men, Lamanite men not taking advantage of girls offered up to the attacking army. We already saw the Nephite manner forcing their daughters to go out and plead for their lives. Uh, that would be a kind of offer, offering these girls up to whatever the attacking army wants to do as long as it's not violent to the men. But the Lamanite men do nothing. They just stop fighting. Uh, we get a whole Lamanite people going to battle to seek justice for their kidnapped daughters, those girls kidnapped by Noah's priests. Uh, Lamoni's wife, jumping to the book of Alma, Lamoni's wife apparently reigns when, it looks like at least, Lamoni is dead, which is itself an astonishing detail. We literally never have any hint among Nephite, uh, Nephite cultures uh, that women have any political power whatsoever. The chief judge dies, there's no question of whether his wife reigns for a time. But among the Lamanites, queens reign. They rule, that's very clear. Uh, Lamoni's own visionary experience, when he comes up out of it, convinces him that his wife has particular spiritual gifts. He comes out of the swoon and reaches out to his wife and then blesses God's name and blesses her and then explains what he's seen in vision, that God will come to the earth through a woman. Uh, not the kind of vision Nephite prophets seem to have. Um, uh, Abish, part of the same story, Abish, in part of a, because of her good relationship with her father, clinches the first conversion of the Lamanites. She's in the right place in the right time when everyone else is passed out on the ground as this convert. She's the center of this story. From a Nephite perspective, she's triply without privilege, by the way, right? She's a Lamanite, so she's racially other. Uh, she's a woman, so she's sexually other. Uh, and she's a slave. She's a servant. She's economically other. Uh, all three things that Nephi says, right? You remember the passage in 2 Nephi 26, 33? That God invites all to come unto him, bond and free, male and female, black and white. She's on the unprivileged side of all three of those. She's the hero in the story, which is really quite remarkable. Lamoni's queen uh, is the only person in the Book of Mormon to speak in tongues. Lots of figures in the Book of Mormon tell us not to deny the gift of tongues. She's the only, the only one we watch do it, which is striking. Uh, the queen of Lamoni's father also bears rule when it looks like her husband has died just a few chapters later. Uh, of course, we have the story of the stripling warriors. Uh, they're among the Nephites, but they're a kind of separate people among the Nephites, and the reason they are there at the right place at the right time is because of their relationship to their mothers. Notice how Abish and the stripling warriors are perfect parallels in the Book of Alma. The missionary chapters succeed because this Lamanite woman and her relationship to her father 
the Nephite war, they win because of these Lamanite boys in relationship to their mothers. Perfect parallel. Um, later, we've already mentioned Samuel coming to talk to the Nephites, uh, but what's striking is that it's the Lamanite prophet who comes and has particular concern for Nephite women's plight in a time of disaster. Uh, and Malachi, a little bit, uh, I guess we're jumping backwards there, but Malachi in the um, war chapters, uh, he eventually marries this Lamanite queen, taking away her power and so on. Um, I think I'm meant to not leave that on there because we already talked about that. Yeah, uh, mistake. Uh, notice the pattern here, right? From start to finish, the glimpses we have in Lamanite society, I mean, basically without exception, are stories of at least relative equality, of domestic tranquility. Again, maybe from a 21st century perspective, we'd go, no, it doesn't look that equal. Fine, fair enough, right? We're dealing with an ancient society. But set side by side with the Nephites, there's something going on here. The pattern is perfectly consistent. I mean, add this data point. We mentioned right at the beginning that we have only three uniquely Book of Mormon women with names in the Book of Mormon. Not one of them is a Nephite. We don't know the name of a single Nephite woman. We have Sariah, but that's before there are Nephites or Lamanites, right? Uh, we have Abish, Lamanite, uh, and we have Isabel, the harlot. She lives in the borders by the Lamanites. It's not entirely clear, but seems likely she's a Lamanite. We don't seem to have the name of a single Nephite woman. But Abish, un un unmistakable hero, right? So the pattern, I think, is really quite clear. What the Book of Mormon seems to be doing here from start to finish is bearing out what Jacob says. Jacob says the Nephites will be destroyed because of what's happening with women in their culture, and that the Lamanites will be preserved and become a blessed people because of what's happening with women in their culture. If we take that then as a lens for the whole of the Book of Mormon, it turns out that the whole book is actually directly and deliberately about women. It's not showing us what it looks like when it goes right, or we get just a few glimpses of that. What it shows us is what it looks like when it goes wrong. The Nephite history is not the history of a, of a wonderful, exemplary people. It's a thousand-year train wreck. We're just watching slowly unfold. It's a disaster. Uh, and the message here is this is why they're destroyed. There are other problems with the Nephites, to be sure. And of course, the Lamanites have their own problems. But the message the book seems to be outlining for us at length is that it is, uh, it is precisely because there is not equality for women precisely because women are possessions or objects, precisely because women are objects of abuse and suffering that the Nephites end uh, in disaster, and precisely because it looks different among the Lamanites. Things go right, uh, they're preserved, and are being gathered right now. Part of the gathering of Israel that President Nelson is constantly talking about. This, I think, is what's going on uh, in the Book of Mormon. It turns out, uh, I think, on close reading, the Book of Mormon has a really clear message here, and one that should be staring us in the face. Uh, we, as a people, should be in the vanguard, so to speak. We should be at the forefront uh, speaking about equality. Our keystone scripture is calling for change and telling us what it looks like if we get this wrong. Uh, we have got to get this right. Uh, we've got to get this right, whether as a people or as a world. This is the message. If we can't get this right, if there is sexism, if there is sexual oppression, then we're headed toward disaster. But where there is sexual equality, uh, where there is uh, a lack of sexual oppression, there are promises of gathering and redemption. This, I think, is part of the Book of Mormon's message for the last days. I think the book couldn't be more relevant in the 21st century. It's trying to point out problems we still have in our culture and calling us to change. Issues a call to repentance. My hope is that we can hear that call uh, and that we can see in the Book of Mormon a reason to lament. When we read the book, if it feels so foreign to women, if it feels unwelcoming to women, exactly feel that and then recognize that that's why it ends in disaster. This book is a reason to celebrate. Uh, not celebrate because it went well, but celebrate because seeing how poorly it went, uh, we can see what we need to change. Mormon 931 is the scripture I'll end on. Uh, this is Moroni writing just after he takes over his father's record. And uh, 
He's worried sick about whether he's a good enough writer and whether anyone will even believe anything he's written. Uh, but he says this as he's wrapping up uh, his first contribution after his father's death. Condemn me not because of mine imperfection, neither my father because of his imperfection, neither them who have written before him. Rather, he says, give thanks unto God that he hath made manifest unto you our imperfections, that ye may learn to be more wise than we have been. Uh, I think that's exactly the message we should hear. If we can see problems in the Book of Mormon here, hallelujah. Celebrate. That's what he says. Give thanks unto God that he hath made manifest unto you our imperfections. Let's be more wise. Uh, I hear that call uh, in the Spirit. Uh, I hear that call from God. We have to do better when it comes to this as a people and as a world. And we have every scriptural reason to do it. Uh, God is so good and he invites all that is my clear testimony God invites all to come unto him black and white, bond and free male and female and if we aren't inviting all if we are still involved in racism or sexism or classism we have got to repent and change that uh, that is the message of God and of Christ that's true and I share you my testimony of it in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.